Well, Jack and Michael, co-creators of The Nick, which just finished up its first season on Cinemax uh, recently. I, I want to know, let's start with you, Jack. Um, this is You both come from more of a comedy background, more of a lighthearted, let's say, background. This is very intense, though, very graphic, uh, almost like a horror show, but real horror, not just the, the fake kind of horror show. Uh, Jack, tell me uh, how, how this idea came about. Well, the idea came about um, because, you know, we'd always been sitcom writers and we'd been uh, comedy writers uh, all throughout our careers. And, uh, and one of the things uh. that happened was that um, we were doing movies and we were really getting frustrated because um, there were fewer movies of the sort that we make and there were more and more writers on each movie. and you were sort of pitching on things that you were less and less excited about, but you were playing the percentages. And we started talking, and every time Michael and I write something that we think no one's ever going to make this, let's write it for ourselves and no one's going to make it, it's always sort of changed our careers. And as a result, we said to ourselves, um, let's try doing something else. Let's try doing something different. And uh, and if no one makes it, no one makes it, but at least we wrote something for ourselves and it felt good. And we'd written a serial killer movie, a serial killer movie for Sony, and we'd written, you know, some very, very dark comedies and some more dramatic things. But, um, you know, this was a bit of a departure. But what happened was, I think we, you know, Michael can tell you how the idea itself germinated. But I think one of the things that emboldened us was that the more research we did, the more interesting we found it. And I think that because it feels a little absurd to our, to our uh, contemporary minds, I think it does fit with our comedy sensibility in a weird way. Um, you know, because we're always looking for what's sort of odd or strange or, or the, the truth in something, that, that kernel of truth that you go, oh my gosh. And so I think that really worked for us um, in terms of looking at this era and this period as as something that we wanted to tackle and, and, and talk about. And I think Michael can probably do a better job of explaining where the actual germ of the idea came from. Um, the actual germ came from a germ. Um, I was um, dealing with a, just a, a health issue at the time a couple years ago, and um, I was just going down the road of different procedures, both um, traditional medicine and alternative medicine. And there were times when I was just really amazed at what medical science had figured out. There were times when I was really frustrated by what medical science hadn't figured out. But at the same time, I had access to so much. You know, I could go online. I could find so much information out about what was going on and um, so many different types of doctors I could go to. So I just started to think about the idea of like, well, what would I have done 100 years ago? What, what, what would have been my options? Um, so... Jack and I, just on a whim, we, we, uh, we bought a couple of medical textbooks off of eBay, and, um, and they were just fascinating. I mean, it, it, just, it was like reading a, a great novel. Like, you just couldn't put it down. And, um, and so the more we got into the world of medicine, then we just started to look at the, um, the history uh, of, the, of the time period, and that was just endlessly fascinating to us as well, which became a, a major part of the show. Michael, of all the things you discovered as you wrote the scripts and you poured over this history, what what individual one thing shocked you the most out of that period? Wow, um, everything. Uh, I'm um, well. I think it was just. If I think medically, um, I think it was just the simple things like uh, what they were using that we would consider so horrific today like for example if you had a problem with your intestines like something like a, a perforation in your bowel the what they would tell you to do is they would tell you to drink turpentine and that was supposed to ease your intestinal tract or um, in the show we have um, the character of Abigail who's suffering from syphilis and she gets these terrible headaches and what they prescribed were these infusions of mercury so you would sit and you would breathe in the, the, the fumes of the, uh, of the mercury, um, which uh, obviously today would never in a million years be uh, a, a remedy. So I think it's those types of things, because again, it was still such trial and error. Um, and those, those drugs were considered uh, miracle workers. 
Um, so I think that from the medical standpoint, that's what I figure was, was, was sort of the most shocking. Jack, one of the most interesting lines, I think, out of the whole, especially in the pilot, uh, that I just, I guess I'd never thought about before, and I don't remember the exact numbers, you probably would, but somewhere, uh, somebody says something like, in, in just the past few years, we've been able to take the, the, the uh, longevity of life from age 39 to age 46, and I just thought that was fascinating. I think it was 38 uh, to 47. Um, okay. And those were real numbers. Um, those are absolutely the real numbers. Um, that speech comes um, about eight or ten minutes into the pilot, and it's Thackeray giving a, a eulogy. Um, he's our main character, Clive Owen's character. And <clears throat> that first section of the pilot really is our welcome to 1900 moment. Um, it goes through really a very interesting, very period-specific, very... Uh, correct for the period surgery um, and and has some death that follows it and for us um, I, I think what we wanted people to understand was that they believed that they were on the outer edge of the technology and medical understanding envelope that they were the that they were the vanguard that they were the pathfinders at the at the absolute leading edge of modernity and they were, but to our minds, we're saying, "Wait a second, really? You know that that's that's all you can expect? You know, I'm two years away from that." <laughs> and and so you so you sit there and and you realize, first of all, how much happened earlier in life. You got married earlier. You had your kids earlier. You became a grandparent earlier. Um, you had to get a lot in because you weren't going to expect to do great things in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now, some people did live into their 80s and 70s, and, and often those were the people who had better sanitation and better access to whatever was medical care at the time. But for us, it was a real signal that these people were discovering the things that now we take for granted that keep us alive. Michael, on the set itself, I guess your your big set piece in most episodes is the the operating area with all the people watching. Are those scenes particularly fun to write? Um, yeah, I, I think we both enjoyed kind of diving into the surgery, the procedures that they used, how they did it. You know, we were really fortunate that a that we were able to find so much of the information. Uh, through these old medical textbooks and also through um, the National Institute of Health's website, which has dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of um, surgical papers from the period. So we would just comb over those and find the surgeries themselves and sort of um, tailor them for the, um, for, the, for the show. But then getting down onto that set and actually watching them perform these surgeries was, was incredible. I mean, Steven Soderbergh, the way he shot it and set it up was amazing. We have very little um, enhanced visual effects uh, that, were, that were put in in post. You know, there's not a lot of digital. It's all kind of done in the moment, in real time. So the blood is really pumping out of those bodies when um, the actors are working on them. When they, when they make that first cut into the body, it's, it's just a gore fest. Um, and I think we were all taken aback at first by how much blood there was, but that's what made it so great because it, it seemed so real and so visceral. So it, it was a real kick to see this stuff that, that Jack and I had sort of just come up in our heads really come to life in a way I don't think we ever expected. And now that the episodes have been seen, what, what are you hearing from the medical community itself? What Are they saying this is, this is spot on or are you surprising even some of those folks? Well, it's interesting. We did have a medical advisor who really is extraordinarily knowledgeable about the era, um, Dr. Stanley Burns. And so uh, we knew we were on target with all of that because he, you know, he has spent the last essentially 50 years of his life um, studying and, and learning all this, plus he's a surgeon as well. Um, but the other thing about it was that I have, I, we were very worried about people going, oh, come on, that's fake. Oh, come on, that's phony. And the nice thing is I, I know so many doctors who watch the show, completely fascinated. Um, part of it is because it's, the, it's an era that they don't know about. They don't know about 
you know where this comes from or that comes from. So for us, yes, it was. It, we've been we have gotten very, 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 very few, um, if any, comments that we're getting it wrong. Part of it is there's no doctor around from 1900, but the other part of it really is that we you know, we did our homework. We worked really hard. The props department worked really hard. The uh, visual effects guys who do who do the the molds and the and the intestines. I mean, we we show everything. You know, we show the, the the intestines when we when we do. This isn't one of those things where you just see it kind of below camera level, and the and the surgeon's hands are are are, are uh, bloody, and then they go back down and go, oh, I can't get to that, you know, to you know, to that to that whatever that that uh, that vein. It's you know, it's us seeing the vein. It's us seeing the blood. It's us seeing all of that, and and we worked really hard to get it right. The prop department affects. Um, and the and the and Dr. Burns, our advisor, put all of our doctors through through his own little medical school. So they all had to learn to suture, and they did. And they had to learn to suture how they did in 1900. So I'm very proud of that because I think we were very afraid of people going, "Ah, it's phony." And we were like, "No, these come straight from the surgical papers of the day." And we had to read 10, 20 different surgeries to find the one that we wanted each time. Well, Michael, along these lines, I mean, I'm always fascinated with folks like yourselves, producers, writers, that take on such a challenge because, you know, it would be so much easier, as you've done in other projects in your life, to, to you know, create a fictional world, but it'd be something of your own rules uh, that's not historical. I mean, th th taking on something like this is just, you've got to get it right as well as make it compelling. Yes, and and I think when Jack and I set out on this, the one mantra we had is, tell the truth. We wanted to, to not sugarcoat anything, and that goes beyond the medical world. That goes into the other, the, the social aspect of the show. We wanted to, to attack race and race relations in, in, in the way that, that it, it was. Um, we wanted to show the way the class stru uh, struggle was. We wanted to show sexism because it was important. I mean, this is, there's, there's, no, there's no romanticizing what life was like. And and um, you know you can you can watch a, a period piece and and it can feel very flowery and romantic and and give you this real sense of like oh isn't life beautiful back then but that wasn't what we wanted to do we wanted to separate ourselves and say like no here's the reality here's what here's here's the truth because everything that we we would read about was so shocking that we felt like well. We haven't seen that before, and we want people to see what that really is. We don't want to whitewash it. We want to, like, for example, with the riot. Jack and I happened upon that in the in the newspapers we were reading from 1900, and said, "Well, we have to put this in. It's just it's just too important, and and it, it draws too many parallels from today that we we can't not show it for what it really was." Have you heard from, from many people that the blood and gore and, and the operations and such have actually turned them off? I mean, they, they just could They wanted to watch the show, and they just couldn't. I, um, Go ahead. Uh, just, I'll, I'll answer quickly. Um, yes, and, yes and no. There are some people. We, Michael and I did a talk at UCLA the other day, and the, one, one person came up to us and said, Oh my God! Is there going to be more a ton of more surgery in season two? Because that was my favorite part. Though I will say this: um, that was done specifically, and I think Steven Soderbergh was the one who really decided the level of gore. And I love the, exactly where we landed. But Steven knew what he wanted, and it was not an accident. Um, we wanted to show the body as it was, very hard, and and what these guys were going through, because we see the psychological toll that the surgeons are going through. We see the psychological toll that on the nurses and on the people. So we need to see what they're seeing in order to understand that, that, that the vulnerability of the human body, the complexity of the human body, the puzzle of the human body. And you can't do that if there's just someone going, hey, there it is, and you don't see any of it. I also think that people got really used to it really quickly. That's one of the things I noticed that a lot of people told me was that, yeah, the first couple of surgeries kind of freaked me out or whatever. But then I just kind of got used to it. And even my mother said the other night at dinner, she said, is it going to be that bloody next year? And I said, well, honestly, um, it might be, yeah. And she said, well, I kind of got used to it at the end. It wasn't a problem. 
And so, you know, if my mother wasn't complaining, then, you know, then it must, it must not have been too terrible by the end. Um, I, think, I think we wanted to show the truth. That's all. Um, Michael, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. Um, I would just add that, you know, I think it's with watching surgery is harder for people than watching um, somebody getting their head chopped off by an axe. I think that, that something like that is, you know, getting your head chopped off by an axe is, is more gratuitous. And it can be almost cartoony. Where this is, this is I think so we're talking real. In the Freddy, I think we're talking. I'm sorry. I think we're talking in the Freddy Krueger sense. Yeah, in the, yeah. In the I mean, sense, yeah. the ice sense. Right. I mean, that's what I mean. I mean, I'm talking fictional. <laughs> I just thought you were thinking that like that was cartoony. <laughs> no, but but I think that when but when you're watching a drama that shows surgery, I think it, it's just because I, there's just something about it that's just that's. Um, too too realistic that 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 can turn people off. People people said I had to look away, but I didn't want to stop watching, and I think that's that's okay. Michael, you we, you both mentioned Steven Soderbergh several times, one of the best filmmakers in the world, especially the last what twenty five years or so. Uh, not only how do you get him involved, but I mean, we've seen a Martin Scorsese do the pilot of Boardwalk, or we've seen David Fincher do you know the pilot of House of Cards, and they're executive producers as well. But how do you get him to do a whole season? That's that's just unprecedented for somebody of his stature. Uh, yeah, and I think we're still, still Jack and I still think it's a dream. I mean, it, um, you know, Stephen. I like to say that you know Jack and I can see the full spectrum of color, but Stephen sees in the ultraviolet. I mean, he can see things that that we would never see in the material. And and I think what it was is that. For, I know for Stephen that it just spoke to him. It spoke to things that he's really interested in. Um, you know, from you know the, the 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 medical show and the hospital show is one of the oldest shows out there, and this was a way to tell that story in a whole different way. And I think that really sparked him. And I think he's really interested in the other things that we cover: race, sex, class struggle. Um, they all sort of hit these these things that that he he really loves all in one package. And so I think that just telling the story in the pilot wasn't wasn't going to be enough for him, which, you know, we were thrilled about. And, and will he be, I know he's executive producing, but will he uh, direct the second season as well? Yeah, he's directing all ten for second season. Wow. Well, I, we're an awards website. We'd like to talk about that some. And I want to know, well, first of all, I feel like he is a slam dunk to win the DGA in a few weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. that, those nominations, I guess, will come out in December, and then uh, the awards will be uh, maybe like late January. But I'll be shocked if he doesn't win the Directors Guild Award, and then Emmys will be way on down the road, you know, way over into next fall. But tell me about, uh, I'm sure you've done uh, screeners, press, press uh, engagements with the Golden Globes, especially Hollywood Foreign Press, um, also with the Guilds. You, you may be up for uh, quite a few different Guild Awards. Tell me about just this process now of, of uh, finishing up a season, but now walking into an award season. Well, I think there's a few nice pieces of it, and I think one is that we're older. Um, we've been doing this for over 20 years, so this isn't happening to us um, at a at a at a tender age where we take it, you know, where we take it too seriously. You know, I I think we think it's it's important because it gets people to like this show. Just being in the conversation means that the show was well received enough and good enough um, for people to say, wow, well, maybe you'd win something. Or you know, If we're nominated, that's wonderful. It, you know, if we won, that would be, you know, I, certainly the icing on the cake. But I, I think for us, you know, our, our goal is, that, is to get people to really like the show and watch it and to watch how great our actors are and how the extraordinary ability of Steven to tell a story and Cliff Martinez's music and you know this this is I just I'm so proud of the finished product and the people involved our costume designers our our hair and our makeup and our and our art directors and 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 so as a result I, I think I just want to sit just want people to say oh my god did you see the neck um, after that if there's a statuette or a thing or a, a certificate that says I was nominated, that's wonderful, but um, the good news is that I think we remove ourselves from that so it doesn't affect us when we're, you know, we've written season two already, 
and now we're just sort of fine-tuning it. All of this sort of craziness happened prior, I mean, after we, 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 we broke out and wrote season two, so I, I feel really good that that's sort of untouched and untainted, and it's still the guys we were at the beginning of this writing the same stuff. Um, and so I hope we're not affected in, in any way. But I, look, I'd love to go. We've never been in that conversation before. I'd love to be a part of it. Um, but I also know how many unbelievably good shows there are. There are so many good shows, some that are classified as miniseries, some that are classified as, you know, as, as dramas. And when you, when you look out there at the landscape, you think to yourself, I don't know how anybody picks only five of these shows because I could pick ten right now and and then turn around and do another ten and think, well, those guys, th those folks did extraordinary work as well. Well, Clive Owen is no uh, stranger to the Globes, especially. Uh, he's won one before in, in a film category. Um, we interviewed him a couple of years ago for Hemingway, uh, which was a lot of uh, a really uh, great performance. How did he get involved with this? He's, he's it's a very um, unique character. I don't think I've ever seen a character like this leading a television show before. Right. Uh, well, um, after Stephen came on board, uh, we um, uh, he we were talking about who we would love to see in the role, and and uh, Clive's name came up very uh, very early on. And um, so he got the script, and he wasn't that interested in doing TV, he even admits. But he spoke to Stephen, and, and Stephen said, just give this a read. And he said he, he was shooting another movie at the time, and he uh, said he sat down in his trailer, and 40 minutes later he closed the script and said, I knew I had to do it. I think it just, again, it's just it was such an interesting and challenging role for him um, that he just he leapt at it, and it's such a complex character that I think he really gravitated towards that. I know that um, uh, when we were shooting the show, Clive had up in his, uh, in his dressing room, he had a dry erase board that would keep track of all his drug use because we didn't shoot the show traditionally where we shot episode per episode. We, we cross-boarded. We shot it like a 10-hour movie. So, you know, one day we could be doing something from episode 7 one, and the same day episode 2. So... Clive really needed to know, like, am I coked up here? Did I, am I coming down here? When was the last time I used? And he really took that extremely seriously, and it really shows in his performance. I mean, I don't, I've never seen Clive um, commit so much to something and, and, and be just stellar in every scene that he's in um, to this degree. I mean, and I, I like so much of what he's done in the past, but I feel like he just brought it to a whole new level. Well, and as Jack mentioned, I, I mean, I would TV, say, so I would say, on top of that, when you're writing, you just want to be as good as possible, and you hope you show up with something worthy of the actors, and and worthy of the crew, and worthy of of the time everyone's putting in, and you know what you you hope and pray for is that they that everybody comes and elevates it, and what was so extraordinary to us was. You know, we, we wrote our, our guts out to, to make this the best it could be. But the thing that we, I think, we both felt on every minute of this was that every single person along the way just elevated it, just brought it to another level. The look, the feel, the sounds, the, 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 the visceral nature of it. Um, and so we feel inordinately grateful. I mean, even, even uh, HBO and Cinemax were just so trusting and just gave us so much room to work that you sit there and you just you just want to be worthy of, of the talents of all these other people um, and Clive and the other actors committed with such trust and that's what our, our set really runs on is they trust the word Stephen trusts the actors they trust Stephen they, you know Stephen trusts all the department heads the department heads trust you know their lieutenants and and on the ADs and Greg Jacobs, who's our one of our tech producers and also our, our first AD, we're all in this thing of everyone has to do their job and do it right. And so you feel so grateful when everybody shows up. Um, because, you know, we're we're two guys sitting in a room going, wouldn't it be cool if he walks in here and says this? And then the, a world a world erupts around that and you go, Wow, 
I, I did. I only wrote the funny words he said, or the, the thing he said, or the, or he picks up a scalpel, and you know that everything else around it is so damn cool. Well, tell me uh, as we finish up here. What you said you've written all of the next season. What's the timeline? When do you when do you shoot that, and then when will we see it? Uh, we start shooting uh, in the beginning of February, and we'll be shooting through the end of May, and I believe we're set to air um, either again next August or maybe September. I'm not I'm not exactly sure if they're going to push the air date a little bit um, just because we're under a tighter post schedule. Um, but yeah, but it will be sometime end of summer, beginning of fall of 2015. And when we say that we wrote them all, uh, Michael and I wrote eight just like we did last season. Stephen Katz, um, uh, who's one of the, the, other, the other writer in the mix, um, uh, he wrote, he wrote two last season. He's writing two this season. So it's 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 a team effort. Well, guys, we really enjoyed it. Good luck with all of the uh, the Guild Awards and Golden Globes and such uh, here in the next few weeks, and uh, of course at the Emmys uh, next summer and next fall. And uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you so Thanks. much.